And thanks, Lillian, for, for that first session um, and, and laying the, the, the foundation really on issues of data protection and data and ethics and data governance, which is really crucial. And this is timely because it's at this stage in time where a lot of conversation actually is ongoing around um, how we protect data because more can, many and many countries are continuing to uh, legislate, uh, coming up with um, data protection laws. Um, the information that we have on the slides may actually be, be not current because there may be a lot of a lot more developments that have have come in. Yeah. So, for example, if we say the countries that have data protection laws, you know, there may be another country that will actually, you know, uh, came up with a data protection law as as soon as yesterday. Uh, very recently, uh, the East African Community uh, decided started actually talking about. Um, having a data governance framework uh, for health in East Africa. And that is a conversation that's ongoing within the East Africa Legislative Assembly. So as you realize, this is a very uh, timely topic that we all need to consider and discuss. And, and nobody may be an expert uh, on this specifically. All have uh, a contribution to make. And uh, we welcome all your suggestions. So we'll have enough time at the end of this session to, to just have a conversation around this topic. Now, I want us to take a journey. Uh, so, of course, we have we have all these laws. Uh, we have digital technology. Actually, I consider the two things that, the two major things, of course, there are many other things, but the two main things that are driving or shaping how we look at data, how we um, discuss data, how we manage data, how we look at data, because now it's not business as usual. We cannot look at data the way we used to 20 years ago. Things have changed. The two things that are driving this conversation actually is one, very fast moving or uh, de digital technology, you know, AI, machine learning, you know, all chat GPT, all these things uh, that are ongoing in, in, our, in, our, in our current generation. And the data protection laws that are being um, enacted, uh, a, a, you know, currently in Africa. So those two things are really driving how we look at data. Um, in the previous slide, um, uh, Lillian talked about, you know, the the UK uh, Council says that all publicly funded research data have to be publicly available. But we have a law that says you have to make sure data is protected. There are laws about localization, you know, um, there are laws about personal data and says that you have to anonymize data. But another question comes, how do you ensure that actually the data is anonymized? So all those conversations, uh, we, we need to have them. So as I said, I want us to have a journey, just as a brief journey. This journey, I call it the data life cycle. Now think about data and think about the processes it goes through. So we, I, I, we are all believers that data is a public good and that we have to manage this data in, in a responsible way throughout um, the stages it goes. And so if you consider this data as, an, as a commodity that is moving from one stage to another, that is what I'm calling the data life cycle. Think about the movement of this data. First of all, you think about this data before you even collect it, before you go to the field, you're already thinking about the data. So it starts at the stage where you conceptualize your study. You know, you're thinking about a proposal, a research proposal, you submit, you get the funding, um, uh, and then you start now thinking about how to go to the field to collect this data. The process that you do at that stage as you're thinking about this very precious commodity are what you know think about that and then there are things of course now you have you have conceptualized your study you are now ready to go to the, to collect the data now you are in that process of training the research collect uh, research assistants or data collectors or uh, field interviewers you are in that process and you are collecting the data that is the stage now you are actually in the field collecting this data what processes or what things that you need to put in place to, uh, to 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 comply with all these things that we are talking about data protection laws uh, uh and, and and the ethics and all those that we, we we have discussed now the data is being collected in the field you have your research assistants 
um, assuming you have trained them and you've trained them on different things, you have trained them on ethics, you have trained them on the data integrity, you have trained them on how to use the data collection tools, you have trained them on how to ask or administer the questionnaires. Uh, you 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 have you have also ensured that they they have a common understanding so to ensure consistency you have done all that now the data is in the hands okay you are in the field so what are these processes now that you put in place in the field so we we talked about issues of consent because you cannot collect data before you get consent uh, from the research participants um now assuming you have the data the participant has consented to to participate in the study and you have asked the questions you have the data, it's, it's in the hands of the data collector who you have hired or you have recruited for your study. Now, what are the processes that you make sure that there is no breach of the issues that um, that uh, Sarah talked about earlier, issues of privacy, issues of confidentiality. What processes do you put in place to ensure that happens? Now, data has to be, because it's in the hands of the, of, of the field interviewers, there's also the aspect of this data has to move. Now, we are talking about digital technology right now. Actually, um, 20 years ago, people or 95, I can, I can even say 99% of the people in Africa, or let's say, be modest, 95% of people in Africa could have been using paper, the paper-based data collection tools. Uh, aspects of, or let's say 15, 20 years ago. Now, a few years ago, issues of electronic data capture started coming in. And we talked about ODK, Open Data Kit, Survey CTO, you know, COBO, and now it's a common practice. Many people right now use electronic data capture tools to collect their data. Now, data is in the hands of the interviewer. How, do, how does this data move from the field to your servers? And these servers could be locally, locally local, local uh, you know, locally housed, or they could be in the clouds, in a cloud somewhere. And, where is that cloud? You know, think about those things. The data transmission process from the field, um, you know, to to the data manager who is sitting somewhere behind a computer looking at the data. The, I saw a question in the chat earlier about social media. Now, currently, we we do, we do a lot of WhatsApp and other social media platforms. In fact, it's very common practice to manage um, field processes or field procedures through a common WhatsApp group that is uh, that's created where all the research, research assistants are, are in and they can be able to share their reports, how they went in, in the field and, and the processes. How do you ensure that th that interaction in the WhatsApp group does not result to breach of privacy of the research participants? Because there is a potential possibility that um, somebody may share some personal data, personal identifiable information of a research participant in the WhatsApp group. How do you ensure protection and privacy of such information? How do you transmit? There are common practice, actually it's very common practice now in many instances that WhatsApp, if you want to share a document, just share through a WhatsApp, you know, through WhatsApp. You can just post it on WhatsApp and everybody will see it. How do you ensure that these, info these documents do not have or do um, not result to, pri to breach of privacy? Now, the data has arrived, assuming it has arrived to the data manager. I am looking at this data behind my computer, and there are people who are interested in this data. So of course, I may be asked, can you share this information with me? So that, you know, and that person may not be within the research research uh, study, or they, 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 they may not be a member of the study. How do you ensure that the data sharing process, the data processing procedures, you know, by the data people, how do we ensure that they are we are applying the standards, we are applying the, you know, all those things. So that is all. I'm describing basically how data governance fits in the whole data life cycle. We have data managers and we have data analysts. They share data amongst themselves. But there are some collaboration also that many studies actually don't happen, you know, for example, in our, in our center, many studies happen across Africa and we have collaborators across the world. There are collaborators in the UK, collaborators in the, U in the US and Asia and everywhere. And the collaborators could be participating in the research process in between, you know, they're conducting analysis, they're conducting data management, data cleaning. How do we collaborate when we have a law that's saying data has to be localized? 
how do we share data amongst ourselves as researchers in this collaboration? So those, that, those now it brings in questions around data sharing agreements, data, um, you know, the data sharing policies or agreements or MOUs between institutions. Now, after the data, there was a question about how, how long do you keep data uh, after you've, you know, after, uh, after, after you finish your research study? Of course, that's another conversation, but it also talk, you 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 have to think about you know the the embargo period by the institution. You have to talk about the delay uh, setting aside the data that is personal data or from the anonymized data or the identified data. I'll be talking about that in the next slides. I just bring the difference between data anonymization and data de-identification. Now I've talked about the data distribution. This data have to be stored somewhere you know, through the, some repositories or some archiving frameworks within the institution or even in a consortium. How do you manage this process? Now, after you have finished the life cycle, I mean, that first process, they, the data can also be reused. The data original purpose has already been done and the data has been stored you know, somewhere. But a student, a, 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 a postgraduate student in a university, requests this data for their master's or PhD thesis. How do you ensure, you know, the, 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 that that use for, of this data, secondary data now, does not again result to breach of privacy and the data sharing um, uh, laws that uh, potentially it was agreed upon earlier. So that is the life cycle of the data. And you realize that it's really important that everybody has uh, are in the, on the same page regarding how we navigate uh, these issues. Now, let's start with the first stage. This is the pre-data collection period. So what are things that are that, 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 that you always need to put in place? Now, these are just pointers, but they may not be exhaustive. They may not be exhaustive. One is that you have to define your data needs. So prior to your data collection, define the specific data requirements that aligns with the organization objectives and the research questions you have, because this will help and guide even when you are do, um, uh, developing your data sharing agreements or data sharing policies, if you're working in a consortium and so on. Planning. Now, there's a very important practice. Uh, we normally call it best data management practices. One of the things in uh, best data management practice is development of data management plans and standard, oper standard operating procedures but it goes beyond that, ensuring that people in the study are actually uh, complying or adhering to the um, standard operating procedures that are developed. This is a very important practice, but in practice, sometimes it means it's not commonly used, uh, commonly uh, done, especially for research studies that are you know, fast paced, uh, a, a study has been you know, awarded for one year, you know. So the process of developing data management plan and the SOPs, it sometimes may take time. It requires approvals. It requires different versions. So that time may not be sufficient. But what can we do? It's important, but what can you do? So it is therefore necessary that even if the study is short, even if it's a few months, six months, there needs to be some guiding principles or guidelines that is telling everybody involved in the team that these are the standards we are going to apply and everybody has to um, adhere to it. And there has to be somebody who is ensuring that uh, that, that, that that happens. Now, before collecting data, this uh, happens, of course, you know, when you have just got obtained and you have, you're planning to now go to, the, to to collect data, you have to do, you know, apply for the ethical review approval you know, from IRBs. And that approval process outlines several things, which I think uh, I'll be mentioning earlier, and I think uh, Sarah also mentioned. I'll be mentioning a bit later. Issues of ethics, you know, issues of consent. How are you exactly going to ensure consent? And consent is not only consent for those ones who, are, who know how to read and write. There may be other sub pe people or participants or research participants in your study who may not know how to read and write? How do, do you take care of their needs? How do you take care of the minors? You know, issues of assent. How do you take care of the vulnerables? You know, especially when now you're talking about mental health, 
you know, how do you ensure, because mental health is a very sensitive topic, you know, sometimes it may have stigma. How do you ensure that this is this happens? So all this uh, happens before you actually go to collect it. So you, as a researcher, members of a study, member, even students, because I know in the audience we have also students and you'll be doing your, I mean, those who are already doing their masters or, or PhDs, and, and you have to, of course, apply for all these ethics and Nacoste and all that, and, you know, approvals. You have to think about these things before actually going to collect data. And this one will help you because when you go ahead and ignore some of these things, it may come to haunt you later, you know, and, and they are actually very stiff penalties. Uh, I remember recently the Kenya Data Protection Office actually um, fined a very huge sums of money uh, to some three, three entities that uh, there were some breach of privacy, you know, so, so it's very important. Now, all this happens, but also you have to make sure that the people working in your team are sensitized and trained, and therefore it, 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 it actually puts a lot of emphasis on the training because sometimes sometimes trainings may be rushed, but time has come that we have to really pay a lot of attention to the training that happens to the research teams before they actually go to collect the data in the field because many of the breach of privacy may happen at that stage. Now, we've talked about pre-data collection period. Let's see what happens now when you're in the field. I in the in my first slide there I was just asking questions. Now what do you do? So I talked about the standard operating procedure. So this it is a, is a time when you actually need to make sure that the standard operating procedures are adhered to. The teams must be oriented on the standard operating procedures, the content, and allow them to ask questions. Allow them to ask questions for clarity. For clarity, um, ensuring that you you know routinely check. Um, and you know those, those spot checks and data quality assurance to ensure that these are adhered to. A practice, a good, good practice in data management is that when data is being collected, that you manage this data in real time. As the data comes, that there's somebody dedicated looking at this data in real time. And there are many technologies now that are available. Uh, to help actually um, make this process easier, you know, because we are doing data electronic data capture right now. We are using ODK, very common. We are using you know survey CTO. We are using red cap. We are using all these you know very good uh, electronic data capture tools, and they have application programming interfaces. And right now, there's a lot of uh, growth in data science, and so it's important to utilize. And these are opportunities that technology brings. Um, it is important to utilize these um, technologies to make our data process easier and more efficient. Automating reports, you know, and there are tools actually right now that you can use to automate reports so that people can be interacting with this data in real time as they come. Now, why this is important is because you can be able to capture any issues early. Can you imagine capturing an issue uh, five months later? Maybe it's a gross research misconduct issue, fraud. Maybe it's a data privacy breach. And you realize, only realize that five months later. And maybe the research, the research participant realizes that and they, they report you uh, to the data protection office. The penalties may be huge. You know, you can be able to capture errors, data errors and inconsistencies. Data governance is not only about privacy. It's also about the quality of the data we, we get because it is streamlining the process to make data available for decision-making or for policy, for evidence-informed decision-making. And we need to use quality data. We need to use real-time data. We need to use latest evidence to be able to make uh, such uh, policy decisions. And therefore, utilizing these modern tools is actually very important. The visualization platforms, you know, dashboards that you can utilize and everybody in the research team can be able to see the data as it comes and you can be able to detect if there are any issues in real time. 
I talked about I talked about standardization, so and 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 consistency, you know, making maintaining consistent maintain consistent data collection methods across all the sources, you know, um, ensuring compatibility and reliability for future use. And there is now a lot of conversation around open science and you know transparency in research. And all this comes with, of course, uh, the, the journals and, and, and the pandas actually are advocating for, you know, uh, open, open access data and open science. And all this uh, goes along with reproducible research, ensuring that the, the evidence or the paper, the data that you report uh, can, be reprodu can be reproducible in, in real time. You know, if somebody uses the same data with the same code, with the same, you know, the same uh, processes, they should be able to re they should be able to get uh, same results. But there are instances where you have a published paper, but when you apply the same methods they used on the same data, you get different results. How do you how do we make sure this happens? This standardization needs to start at the point of collecting data. It's not only at the time of analysis. And so ensuring that we have consistent data collection tools or instruments, questionnaires, if the question, if, if the data are, 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 are um, if the study design is longitudinal, where you're collecting data at multiple time points on the same individuals, then a, a question called sex, and this, you know, a variable is called sex, and it's coded one, two, or one to mean male and two female, um, two months later, when you're going to, for the follow-up, the same question needs to be called exactly the same way and coded exactly the same way. That is for you know for consistency because sometimes you may lose information when you have inconsistent uh, methods. Metadata question. Now, metadata. Just to define metadata here, this is information about data. In a, in a, in, in simple terms, it is data about data. So it's important to, and this is important because it is describing the data, it's information that describes the data. Because when you have a data that a data set that has uh, 1,000 records, you know, you may just need maybe a page that is describing uh, some information about this data. And so there's a lot of conversation right now, actually in the data science space around metadata that is machine readable and also human readable. And so there's a lot of conversation. So ensuring that this documentation happens in practice and in real time. 